The old Seth, Thomas Regulator, began to chime in the hour. Oliver Metcalf kept typing only long enough to finish the sentence before abandoning the editorial. He was composing to gaze thoughtfully at the wood-cased clock that had hung on the wall of the Blackstone Chronicle's one-room office for far more years than Oliver himself could remember. It was the clock that first fascinated him when his uncle brought him here more than forty years ago and taught him how to tell time. The clock still fascinated him, with its rhythmic ticking, and because it kept time so perfectly that it had to be adjusted by no more than a single minute every year. Now, after marking the thousands of hours of his life with its soft chime, it was reminding Oliver that the hour had come for him to perform his part in an event that would take place only once. Today, the town of Blackstone was going to take the first significant step in the destruction part of his history. Oliver Metcalf, as editor and publisher of the town's weekly newspaper, had been asked to make a speech. He'd made preparatory notes for several days, but still had no idea precisely what he would say when the moment finally arrived for him to stand at the podium. The great stone structure rising behind him and face his fellow townsmen. As he picked up the sheaf of notes and tucked it into an inside pocket of his tweed jacket, he wondered if inspiration would strike him when at last he had to speak, or whether he would stare speechlessly out at the gathered crowd as they gazed, waiting at him. Questions would be in their minds, questions no one had spoken aloud for years, questions which he had no answers. He locked the office door behind him and stepped out onto the sidewalk, crossing the street to cut through the town square. He considered turning back, skipping the ceremony entirely, and instead finishing the editorial upon which he'd been working on all morning. It was, after all, exactly the kind of day that was meant for staying indoors. The sky was slate gray. The previous night's wind had stripped the last of the leaves from the great trees that spread a protective canopy above the town, from spring through the fall. In early spring, when the enormous oaks and maples first began to bud, the canopy was the palest of the greens. But as summer progressed, the foliage matured and thickened, darkening to a deep green that shaded Blackstone from August's hot glare and sheltered it from the rain squalls that swept through on their way toward the Atlantic Sea coast, several miles to the east. Over the last few weeks, abundant green had given way to the splendor of fall. And for a while, the village had gloried in autumn's shimmering golden red and russet tones. Now the ground was littered with leaves, already a dead-looking brown, already beginning the slow process of decay that would return them to the soil from which originally sprung. Oliver Metcalf started towards the top of the hill, where the most of the town people would soon be gathered. Snow had not yet fallen but a sodden, chill rain had accompanied last night's wind. It seemed to Oliver that a damp, freezing winter was about to descend. The grey light of the day seemed perfectly to reflect his own bleak mood. The trees, with their huge, naked limbs, raised their skeletal branches grotesquely towards the sky, as if seeking to ward off the lower clouds with fleshless, twisted fingers. Ducking his head against the ominous morning, Oliver quickly walked through the street, nodding distractedly to the people who spoke to him, meanwhile trying to focus his mind on what he would say to the crowd that would soon be gathered around the best-known building in town, the Blackstone Asylum. Throughout Oliver's life, throughout the lives of everyone in Blackstone, the massive building constructed of stones dug from the fields surrounding the village had loomed at the top of the town's highest hill. Its long, shuttered windows gazed out over the town, not as if it were abandoned, but rather as though it were sleeping, sleeping and waiting some day to awaken. A chill passed through Oliver as the thought crossed his mind, but he quickly shook it off. No, it would never happen. Today, the destruction of Blackstone Asylum would commence. A wrecking ball would swing hurling its weight against those heavy gray stones, and after dominating the town for a full century, the building would finally be torn apart, its stone walls demolished, its turrets fallen, its green copper roof sold off for scrap. As Oliver 
stepped through the ornate wrought iron gates that pierced the fence surrounding the asylum's entire ten acres, and started up the wide, curving driveway leading to its front door, an arm fell across his shoulders, and he heard his uncle's familiar voice. Quite a day, wouldn't you say, Oliver? Harvey Connolly said, his booming, hearty voice bellowing his eighty-three years. Oliver's gaze followed his uncle's, fixing on the brooding building, and he wondered what was going through the old man's mind. No point in asking. For despite their closeness, he'd always found his uncle far more comfortable discussing ideas than emotions. If you talk about emotions, you have to talk about people, Harvey had told him back when he was only ten or eleven years old, home from boarding school for Christmas. And talking about people is gossip. I don't gossip, and you shouldn't either. The words had clearly signaled Oliver that there were many things his uncle did not want to discuss. Still, as the old man gazed up at the building that had risen on North Hill only a few years before his birth, Oliver couldn't help trying one last time. Your father built it, Uncle Harvey, he said softly. Aren't you just a little sorry to see it go? His uncle's grip tightened on his shoulder. No, I'm not, Connolly replied, his voice grating as he spoke the words. And neither should you be. Good riddance to it is what I say. We should all forget everything that ever happened there. His hand fell from Oliver's shoulder. Everything, he said once more. Half an hour later, Oliver stood at the podium that had been erected in front of the asylum's imposing portico, his eyes surveying the crowd. Nearly everyone had come. The president of the bank was there, as was the contractor whose company would demolish most of the old asylum, keeping only the facade. The plan was to replace the interior with a complex of shops and restaurants that promised to bring a prosperity to Blackstone that no one had known since the years when the institution itself had provided the economic basis for the town's livelihood. Everyone who was involved in the project was there, but there were others as well, people whose parents, grandparents, even great-grandparents had once worked within the stone walls behind him. They hoped that the new structure might provide their children and grandchildren with jobs. Beyond the assemblance, just inside the gate, Oliver could see the small stone house that had been deeded to the last superintendent of the asylum. Upon the occasion of his marriage to the daughter of the chairman of the asylum's board of directors, when the Blackstone Asylum had finally been abandoned and his last superintendent had died, that house too stood empty for several years. Then the young man who had inherited it, having graduated from college, returned to Blackstone and moved back into that house, the house in which he'd been born. Oliver Metcalf had come home. He hadn't expected to sleep at all the first night, but to his surprise, the two-story stone cottage seemed to welcome him back, and he'd immediately felt as if it was home. The ghost he'd expected had not appeared, and within a few years he'd almost forgot he'd ever lived anywhere else. But in all the years since then, living in the shadow of the asylum his father had once run, Oliver had not once set foot inside that building. He told himself he had no need to. Deep in his heart, he'd known he couldn't. Something inside its walls, something unknowable, terrified him. Now. As the crowd fell into an expectant silence, Oliver adjusted the microphone and began to speak. Today marks a new beginning in the history of Blackstone. For nearly a century, a single structure has affected every family, every individual in our town. Today we begin the process of tearing that structure down. This signifies not only the end of one era, but the beginning of another. The process of replacing the old Blackstone Asylum with the new Blackstone Center will not be simple. Indeed, when the new building is finally completed, its facade will look much as the asylum looks today, constructed of the same stones that have stood on this site for nearly a hundred years. It will look familiar to all of us, but at the same time, all of it will be different. For half an hour, Oliver continued speaking his thoughts organizing themselves as he spoke in the same simple, orderly prose that flowed from him when he sat at his computer.
composing a feature or an editorial for the newspaper. Then, as the bell in the Congressional Church downtown began to strike the hour of noon, he turned to Bill McGuire, the contractor who would oversee the demolition of the old building and construction of the new complex of shops and restaurants as well. Nodding, Oliver stepped away from the podium, walked down the steps to join the crowd, and turned to face the building as the great lead wrecking ball swung down for the first time towards the century-old edifice. As the last chime of the church bell faded away, the ball punched through the west wall of the building. A sigh that sounded like a moaning wind passed through the crowd as it watched half a hundred field stones tumble to the ground, leaving a gaping hole in the wall that had stood solid through ten decades. Oliver, though, heard nothing of the sigh, for as the ball smashed through the wall, a blinding flash of pain shot through his head. Through the pain, a fleeting vision appeared. A man walks up the steps towards the huge double doors of the asylum. In his hand, he holds the hand of a child. The child is crying. The man ignores the child's cries. As man and boy approach the great oaken doors, they swing open. Man and boy pass through, and the enormous doors swing closed again.